Amen. God bless you. Be seated. By the grace of God, the grace of God tomorrow morning, the anointing service, uh, our divine connection will be an anointing service being the first for the month. Praise God. And we believe God to do wondrous things in our lives. The time is 6.45 here and make it a date. Uh, anointing service is next Sunday by the grace of God. And we'll continue in the theme, God of unlimited ability. Amen. And of course, you know that every August we have um, our seven days program at the end of the month to transit into the ember month. And we always have, we used to call it battle at midnight, but God changed it to victory at midnight. Amen. So we will have it this month by the grace of God. And that means it's for seven days, the last seven days of the month. And the theme that God has given us is Beraka. Those who know what that means will rejoice. Those who don't, go and read your Bible. <laughs> go and do Google search. Search for Beraka and you will find out and you can rejoice like the rest of us. Praise God. Luke chapter one, 5 verse is 1 to 9. Luke 5, 1 to 9. I'm going to take talk on God of unlimited ability, part 1, and then part 2 in the second service. Part 1, we'll look at this scripture in Luke. Part 2, the scripture we'll use is in Acts, the man at gate beautiful. So let's take Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 9 for first service, the part 1. Reading from verse 1, and you should put your eyes on the Bible or on the if they put up the scriptures, well, you can read it from there. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. Are you following me, please? He stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two sheep standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the sheep, which was Simon's, and prayed him or begged him or appealed to him that he would thrust out a little from the land. Thank you, Lord. And he sat down and taught the people out of the sheep. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken how many? Nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other sheep, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the sheep, so that they, both sheep, began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the drought of the fishes which they had taken. And so, when, and so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Verse 11, I'll stop there. And when they had brought their sheep to land, they forsook all and followed him. Praise God. Not breathe upon your word, quicken it in our hearts, O God. Make an indelible mark in our hearts through this word of the Lord Jesus. So this is a demonstration, if you may, of God's unlimited ability. How? Same conditions, different results. They had fished. You know the story. So don't let me go too much into it. They had fished how long? All night. And caught nothing. Fruitless effort. And so these were frustrated men who just wanted to go home. Go and sleep. Because they had to go out the next night or that same night to go and try again. But Jesus came and 
the same lake, Gennesaret. He didn't say, well, guys, there's no fish here. Just let's move to River Jordan. And you will catch fish. No. Same place. Same lake, Gennesaret. Same boat that they used to fish all night. Same nets that they used to fish all night. Same human resources that worked all night. The only thing that changed was the word he spoke. Launch out into the deep, you will catch a great drought. By the time he spoke that word, everything had changed. All they needed to do was obey. Jesus made a difference. Everything was the same. See, he is the game changer. I said, Jesus is the game changer. It's not about changing profession. No, change your allegiance. Put it in Jesus. It's not about changing this or changing that, changing my business. No, change who you are listening to. Begin to listen to him. Same conditions, different results. You will see it through the Bible. That's God's signature. He will do the same condition and produce different results. Same thing with Abraham. Same thing with Isaac. The Bible says Isaac sowed in the land. Famine. It's not as if Isaac's land was different. It's not as if Isaac's seed, God gave him a special seed and said, no, use this one to sow. The same seed that everybody was planting, he planted. On the same land, under the same weather, in the same country, in the same state, in the same location, he got a hundredfold. Others got nothing. Again, the game changer. The word of God. Praise God. This can be somebody's story today. Every life that was so, in fact, God, as I was praying, as I was talking now, he reminded me, he said, no, there's one more. There was a disadvantage. It wasn't just about same condition. Thank you, Lord. There was a disadvantage in this case. Because if I'm disadvantaged, two of us can graduate from the same university, the same time, study the same course. You had a first class. I had a third class. Who's disadvantaged? Third class. But would it not be ridiculous if we both go for an interview for a job in the U.S. and they take me? I return with the employment letter, the other one first class, even a bigger, better university or whatever. It would blow your mind. That's how God signs his signature. So that I will know that, Emeka, you didn't do it. Stop deceiving yourself. I will know that the glory belongs to him. Him alone, not anything I did. So he said they were disadvantaged. First, they were, it was daybreak. You don't catch fish at daybreak. That's not when fishermen go out. The sun is out. Everything is clear. So not right. So the condition was not right that time. Secondly, he showed me something as I was reading now. He said, he said, push out. He told the deep. And catch. They went back. Do you think they went as far as they went before? I mean, you are tired, you are exhausted, you want to go home. When somebody says, enter into the deep, you say, well, okay. And you just, you know how children do when you say, go and sit here. They don't want to sit there. And they will get there and stand very close to it. They are not seated. You say, I said, that's why I said you should stay. Then they will move close to That's what they will just do. But they caught. The game changer was there. He had sent his word. And as long as you align with that word, you will take in a harvest. Five keys and five prayer points will do quickly. Number one key. The people's desire is your open door to breakthrough. The people's desire is your open door to breakthrough. Listen to the first verse. It says, and it came to pass that the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. It wasn't Peter that said, I want to hear the word of God. The people said, we want to hear. The people had something they desired and that desire was Peter's open door to breakthrough. What was David's open door to break through? The desire of the people to get Goliath out of the way. It was David's open door. That was how he gained prominence. And he said, oh, who's this little boy? Saul said, bring him to me. I want, to, I want him to be part. That was his open door. Brethren, yes, Nigeria looks somehow. Yes, things are 
not going well by normal eyes. But because there's so much problems, there is also so many opportunities. It abounds in this country. All you need to do, you know when I was writing this, the Lord said the problem is many times, instead of becoming solution-minded in the midst of the problem, we join those who are the problem. That's what happens. And you cannot be the solution while you are also the problem. You have to choose which one to be. If you choose to be part of a problem, then sorry, you can't be part of a solution. But you and I must, as children of God, henceforth become solution-minded. Open your eyes and begin to see what's around me that creates an opportunity. Fuel has gone up. They say people are parking their cars now. They don't want to. That creates an opportunity for somebody to think and say, okay, how can I do this and help people? It creates an opportunity. Some people are looking at bringing in electric motorcycle now and all those things. It creates an opportunity. But when you are the one complaining, what kind of life is this? Why well, just finish it? You cannot see anything. And God has opened the door of breakthrough to you. They say it's at such times that many millionaires are born. More millionaires are brought forth at times like this. Will you be them? Or are you going to be part of the problem, whining and complaining? Why is God doing this? I want you to rise up and pray. We are going to ask God to open our eyes to see the opportunity inside the problem. So that I can profit from every season. If at every point in your life, all you see is opportunities, you can profit from every season. And when God spoke this in my heart, he reminded me of the scripture in Psalm 1 that says, He shall bring forth fruit in his season. His leaves shall not, whatsoever he doeth. Is there a time to whatsoever he doeth in summer? Whatsoever he doeth in winter? So whatsoever he does. I want you to pray. Please pray with all of your heart. And say, Father. Father. Please open my eyes. Let me see opportunity in the midst of problems. Lord, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we have prayed. I said, say, believe in, amen. amen. Pentecostals are not supposed to be quiet people. We are noisy in the house. So when I say in Jesus' name, you say loud, amen. Number two, lesson, and you will pray. You can sit down. You can also stand if you want. It does not matter how the day started. God can turn it around in one encounter. In one encounter, God can turn it around. It does not matter how it started. Don't get so tied up about your beginning. Don't get so riled up about how the day has started. Don't get so tied up about how your destiny started. How your parents didn't have money. How you grew up in the village. How you did not graduate well. How they didn't. Don't get tied up in that because all of that can turn in an instant once God shows up and has an encounter with you. They fished all night. So the day started in sorrow. By daybreak, they were already in sorrow. What kind of life is this? How are they going to go home and tell their wives, all of them, and say, well, madam, uh, we came back empty-handed. How do you explain it to your wife and the children who are probably waiting at home that daddy is coming with goodies? And then daddy walks in empty-handed, tired, bruised and busted and disgusted and frustrated. So the day started wrongly. But one encounter. What we hear in verse 5, Simon said, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. But then in verse 7, we are reading another thing. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so that they began to sing. Story changed. Weeping may endure for a night. But joy, I'm telling somebody, joy cometh. Joy cometh. Joy cometh. Joy cometh. 
I said joy cometh. See, when the dawn is closest, when the joy is about to break forth, Satan ramps up the pressure and you are just at the verge of giving up. Brethren, if you are under the sound of my voice online or here and you are at the verge of giving up, I want to announce to you that you are on the verge of your breakthrough. You are on the verge of your joy. You are on the verge of your victory. Don't back down. Don't give up. So it doesn't matter. There was a widow in 2 Kings, verse 4, that the day started terribly from verse 1. Somebody came to take her children because she was owing money. And she said, what am I going to do? My husband, no work with you, like a prophet too. How he managed to borrow money or whatever, only God knows. But she had left the woman in debt. And now they wanted to take the two children. So that's a bad day for any woman. That's a bad day for any family. But an encounter. The prophet said, go, borrow vessels. Borrow not a few. But all I have is more oil. Don't worry when you get home, start pouring. By the time we get to verse 7 or so, this woman had become an oil merchant. He said, go, sell, pay off your debt, leave off the rest of it. So it wasn't just about paying off debt, she was now... She had enough to live off of it. It does not matter how this year started. Come on, child of God. I say, come on, child of God. If God created the whole universe in six days, you can only imagine what he can do. August, September, October, November. Man, five months with God? Come on. Come on. Come on. God can turn 50 years and restore it in five days. What am I saying? He can restore it in five days minutes one encounter with God that's all it takes to turn it around I remember our our own game turning or game changing encounter well maybe two things one of them was the day we went as daddy to go and attend day out with daddy G my wife and I it happens every year but we've never gone because this was for rich people and we were really poor so we didn't think, but a day came when one of our pastors, God bless, bless God for pastors who, who will challenge you. Listen, I'm not called to make you feel good. I'm called to pull you up. I'm called to press you forward. You don't come to church to feel good and say, ah, what pastor says today pained me. He, he pained you, wake up. If he pains you, get up. It means there's something you need to clean up in your life. That's a good thing. If you come here and I tell you, well, all is well, go home. This and, Is that what you want? So he challenged us and said, no, go. Take the card. Go. So we went reluctantly. My wife and I went. By the time he got time to pledge money, I was looking at my wife. We didn't have any money to pledge. And that is talking about sponsoring Congress. Is it 10 naira you're going to so, use to support Congress? So I looked at her. In fact, by the time she opened her mouth and spoke what we were supposed to pledge, I thought I made a mistake carrying her. Because <laughs> I'm thinking 50K so we can, you know, be paying maybe 10, 10K every month before December would have finished it. And she says, no, let's do 250K. I looked at her and said, I said, your, mama, your papa put money somewhere where you never tell me. That's what I was thinking in my heart, but I didn't say it out. But she somehow, she said, let's just write it. And that did you pray for us that God will make it easy for you to fulfill it. And we wrote it with our hands trembling. Because they say a fool is the one who makes a van does not keep it. So we may become fools if we don't do it. But you know, that day, whether it was a Saturday, yeah. Whether the next day or the next Sunday, I'm not sure now. The next day. After service, someone walks up to me, a brother, and says, Pastor, my wife gave birth to a set of twins, and they are doing well, and I just want to thank you. And he put a check in my hand, an envelope. And I held it, and I prayed with him. And he left. And I continued what I was doing, leaving it at, well, after service, I'll have time. And I handed it over to my wife. No, I think I opened it afterwards when I was done. And there were so many zeros that it was almost making me dizzy. Because I'd never seen that number of zeros in a check with my name on it. It was the first time in ministry I'd received a check of one million naira. And I looked at it. 
I gave it to my wife to be sure. Count the zeros and be sure this is what we are seeing. And she did. We were able to pay. We put 250 and God now puts. It was with extreme ease. But that was a game changing. The second one was when we pledged that every income that comes to us, not only will we pay our tithe, we'll pay 10% to the building project. From that day till today, God has not allowed us to lack in anything. Just that encounter. God said to me this morning, he said, every minute is a... I know people talk about defining moments. Every minute is a defining moment. God says it's just a matter of application. It's what you do with that minute that counts. Every minute of your life is a defining moment. It doesn't have to be one big minute. Every minute. This minute is a defining moment. There's somebody right there. Some people here who are right now taking decisions as I'm talking. It's a defining moment. I want you to pray. I say, Father... Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. rise up on your feet. I think this AC is that we bought and made this place very cold. It's also affecting your fire. Some days we'll just switch off some and open the door. By the time you are hot, you'll be praying with fire. <laughs> Lift your voice and say, Father. Father, Father, Father. give me a season-changing encounter. Today, and help me. So take the action to possess it. Because there's an action. Go ahead and talk to the Almighty God. Father, today give me a season-changing encounter. There is an encounter that turns the season. A season-changing encounter. And Lord, help me to take the action required. Peter had a season-changing encounter. But he still needed to launch out into the deep. He needed to take the action that that order required. Father, let today be a season changing encounter for me oh god and lord the help i need to take the action that is required to possess it grant unto me grant unto me the help oh god i lift up my eyes unto you lord help me help me help me to take it help me to take it in the name of jesus thank you father in jesus mighty name we have prayed Amen. we'll stop at this one failure ends number three lesson I said five, but we'll stop here. Failure ends where obedience begins. You know what I like about this? The, 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 for me, the most important word in this Luke chapter 5 from verse 1 to 11 that we read. The most important word. Who can guess that word? Yeah. Nevertheless. Once he said nevertheless. It changed. Once he said, as soon as he, Satan was smiling when he was saying, we have told all that and caught nothing, Satan was like this. Yeah, yeah, right. you got that right, boy. But when he said, nevertheless, Satan said, oh God, oh my goodness, this man. No. That was where the tide turned. God said to me this morning, he said, a nevertheless moment never leaves you the less. A nevertheless moment never leaves you the less. Peter came out more. Through a nevertheless moment. That was what happened to us when we sowed that seed. It was a nevertheless moment. We didn't have the money. Nevertheless, let's make the pledge. Somebody is right now having a nevertheless moment. It doesn't look like it. Nevertheless. I remember one of my daughters who had pledged when we were buying this land, raising money. She pledged the money that she was saving for the school fees of her daughter to go abroad to school. So we're not talking small money, several millions. She came to me and said, I feel led to sow this. But I was saving it, it's supposed to be for my daughter's school fees. My daughter was about entering university. I said, well, if you feel led, go ahead. And before I knew, she did the transfer. But then, a few months ago, she came excitedly to me. She had a nevertheless moment. This money is saved up for school and this girl needs to go to school. Nevertheless. When Daddy Gio cleared his account, because the then superintendent, Parking Dayomi, said, every worker, go and clear your account so that we can buy what we want to buy. He was the only one, him and mommy, 
out of all the workers that cleared the account in obedience. He had, that was a nevertheless moment. This sounds foolish. This sounds idiotic. I don't understand it. Nevertheless. If thou be willing and obedient. That's what it takes. Nevertheless, turns it tight. Ah, Neko, Presa, Ozinia. She returned and said, As to have a problem. What's the problem? Several universities, Ivy League, have offered these girls scholarships upon scholarship upon scholarship. Now, I'm having a problem which of them to choose. A few weeks ago when we were talking, the scholarship even covered flight to the school from Nigeria. I said, oh, which kind of school? I, Lord, I am also your son. No? But then you forget the nevertheless moment. God said to me this morning, he said, failure is hanging around you because you are messing around in disobedience. Failure is hanging around you because you are messing around in disobedience. Forgive. You say, no, I can't forgive. They hurt me real bad. Honor the person who's the leader. You say, no, they are useless. They are this. No problem. Pay your tithe. All income. Pay tithe. You say, ah, oh, no, this will not do. You are messing around with disobedience. And failure is hanging around you. That's what he said. Last prayer point. You are going to pray. Rise up on your feet. This morning, the tide turns for somebody. I said this morning, the tide turns in favor of somebody. Where you didn't catch anything before, you are going to have an overflow. In the name of Jesus. Okay, Lord. You are here, you, you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. He's the game changer. He is the what? I want to give my life to Jesus. I want things to change. I've been through this. I've been through that. But this is the time. It is you. I want to lift up your right hand wherever you are. God bless you. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Lift your hand. Come. As soon as he enters your boat, he enters your life. My goodness. The tide turns in your favor. Failure becomes success once you surrender completely. Peter did not only surrender his boat. Peter surrendered his will. He wasn't willing to launch in. He surrendered his will. Some of us are doing part surrender with Jesus. You surrender in this area, but the other side you say, Lord, this one, eh, be as he gets. No, he wants all to surrender. Face the altar. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Are we not grateful to God? You're not acting like it. Amen. Those of us in front, I want you to sincerely from your heart, talk to God and say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I believe in my heart. That you are the son of God. That you came in the flesh. And you died. And you rose again. I confess with my mouth. That you are Lord. Of my life. Come into my heart. And take residence. Take over my life. I surrender it to you. I am born again today. I'm a child of God from today. Amen. Father, I thank you for your children. No one comes except the Father draws. Thank you for drawing them. Thank you for what you've started. Glorify your name in their lives. That they will not turn back. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. If you turn to your right, just follow that brother quickly. They'll bring you back. Then we need your name and your number. Rise up on your feet now and take this prayer point as we close. I finish here. Say, Father, Father, I repent of every area of disobedience in my life. And I commit to obey you totally today. 
Turn every failure to success. In the name of Jesus. Go ahead and make this commitment and then ask God. Father, every area of failure, turn it to success. In the name of Jesus. Turn it to success. Turn it to success. Every area of failure. I commit to obeying you in every area of my life. Every area. Total obedience. I'm not holding back any portion. I commit to total obedience. But Father, every area of failure in my life, oh God, let it become success. Let it be turned to success. Whether in my marriage, whether in my business, in all. Success in the name of Jesus. Success in the name of Jesus. Success in, I may have tried last year and I failed. But Lord, as I commit to obeying you in every area, Lord, today, turn it to success. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Thank you, Father.